everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. And today I'm sitting down with Margaret Trudeau. Yes, she's the mother of Canada's current prime minister, Justin Trudeau. But that's not even the most fascinating thing about her life. In her one woman show, Certain Woman of an Age, Trudeau shares intimate stories about her days as Canada's first lady, motherhood, nights at Studio 54, conversations with the Dalai Lama, and how she came to understand her bipolar disorder. The 80 minute show is sometimes funny, sometimes sad, but always refreshingly honest. Please put your hands together for Margaret Trudeau. Thank you very much, Chris. How are you doing today? It's lovely to be here. Just terrific. Thank yes, you. I'm so happy to be sitting across from you. I, I came to the show last night. Thank you. It was an amazing performance. Um, it's so rare that you see somebody who has taken the time to understand their story and is sitting in front of you just living in their truth. I mean, that's so rare and so... Well, you. it's because I, I had to examine my life uh, because I, I suffer from bipolar. And as I say in the play, um, one of the first things that we do when we have a mental illness is deny that we have one. And my denial phase lasted about 25 years. So once I did get start getting well, I really had to know myself. I had to know my moods, know my reactions, know, know how to be uh, in a good way instead of being in a, in a mentally ill way. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think it is a lesson for a lot of us, even if we aren't having a similar struggle, oh, just to take time to be to. honest with yourself and really look at the choices you made and how that impacted your life and other people. And I mean, without shame, yeah. because shame really holds us back. I, I'm quite shameless. Certainly I'm shameless about having a mental illness mm -hmm. because the shame is not having a mental illness. The shame is having one and not seeking treatment mm -hmm. because you can't fix yourself, you won't get better, and the collateral damage yeah. in your family and the people who love you is huge. So it's something you have to face and not deny and say, well, what can I do about this? And, and you it. certainly do in this 80 <laughs> minutes. So tell me why, because you've written books in the past, but tell me why you wanted to tell your story again in this format. <laughs> I, it, honestly, I have to say it was never my idea. I've done it. I, I'm a public speaker. I'm a mental health advocate. And I go out and I get on the podium, and I start at the beginning when I'm a little girl and go through. And then my great friend, Diana Alexander, who is a producer and a brilliant, brilliant woman, she, um, she said she wanted to... To, to tell my story in a play. What did I think about that? And so she had me look at, at uh, Kimberly Senior, who's our director, one of her works that she'd done with a, a comedian. And he just stood on stage for an hour and a half and talked about his attempted suicides. And actually, it was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so refreshing that someone was talking about it, yeah. and particularly a man. And I looked at the possibility of this. And as a, as a mental health advocate, that's all I want to do is to reach people and to get them to change their minds, to stop being fearful of an illness that can you can have recovery from, like any other one. And uh, my only complaint is that it wasn't longer, oh, thank um, you. because you you touch on so many things, and it's so interesting. And I, I can imagine the process of whittling your life down to we 80 minutes so must have been hard. We had so many stories, and one after the other, they're cut out of the play. They're cut. What, what happened to that story? Yeah. Well, because it's timing. And but I do have four books where all the right. stories live. So. Yeah. <laughs> Is there one story that you had to cut out that you really wish you could have left in? Oh, there were so many, but I'm trying to think which what what, what example I could can use we had oh I know the one was um, because I do actually use obs I don't even call it obscenities but uh, I, you know what I do says I, fuck. I, yeah I get the whole audience <laughs> to say fuck you <laughs> as a sign of our anger not as a being rude but just to nobody can tell me what to do or that it hasn't been done you know, anyway, so uh, uh, Pierre, uh, this is a, a cute story, Pierre, uh, three weeks before we were married, and it was a secret wedding, and nobody knew who I was because I never went out with him in public because I didn't like that. I should have been warned that I wasn't going to be very comfortable in that the position as the wife of the prime minister. But the three years that we dated were a lot of fun and quiet and private and usually outdoors because that's what we did. But uh, he, he was nervous uh, before we got married, and he was the most elegant, elegant, man, the way he spoke, he's just such an intellectual, perfect. And he shouted out over the, over the, in the house, our house of commons, the, the parliament, uh, he shouted out uh, mouth to one of the leaders, people in the opposition, <laughs> and, and so they translated it immediately into, he'd said, fuddle duddle. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then there was fuddle duddle everywhere. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and he never, and but they didn't know that he was getting married in three weeks and why in the world would this elegant, totally beautiful man suddenly be shouting, you know, mouthing, he didn't say it. Yeah. But it was my influence, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think we all need to say, say fuddle duddle every <laughs> once in a while. So You do. And, it, and as I say in the play, um, the younger generation is just sort of born into their own yeah. ones. It's not, it's not what it used to be yeah. about at all. It's just an expression of our anger or our, or our humor, whatever. I think what is so fascinating in, in you telling your story is we know sort of the Wikipedia version, right? The big sort of moments, and you really take those moments and you break them down. And we know that you were married very young at 22, and he's yes. 29 years older. But what maybe I didn't understand was that at that phase in your life, you had just gone on vacations and you were still exploring and getting to know yourself, and then you were well, just thrown what, uh, onto the platform. There's a lot of, I, I, and it is a comedy, the play, yeah. and it's also a tragedy, of course. Um, but it's also, I, I talk about brain science and, yeah. and neuroscience. I have a picture of a brain in it. So I, I do know a lot about the brain, but one of the interesting things, getting married so young in your early 20s, is yeah. that uh, I was unfinished. My brain had not finished developing. It, that happens between 25 and, uh, and 30, yeah. that the final, your, fa your brain is finally formed. And the biggest part of it is formed that is aware of the consequences <laughs> of your actions. So when you're too young and you're you rip into a marriage uh, not ready and prepared for it because you're too young. So I have I told all my children that they had to wait till they were 30 before they got really serious, and they all did. I think that's really, really great <laughs> Be advice. Be teenagers until you're 30. And then being a parent and doing all that is hard work. So have all the fun so you have no regrets later, that you know the choice you've made is the right one to have children and no regrets. But sow your wild oats and yeah. travel and be in a cubicle for a while and put a backpack on. I did, Margaret. I, we have, I I'm did. sure you did. You know, <laughs> when I, watching, I was like, yes, this is great advice because I think so many people maybe kind of jump the gun before, like you said, their brains are developed. And well, we a lot used to, to because of the, the women's position, of course, we used to get married very young to get out of our parents' home. That was the only way. And that's all changed since the uh, 1965 and we got the birth control pill, which I think was the biggest revolution of the 20th century because it freed us to have to not to have to get married immediately. <laughs> Choice know? is a powerful thing. Choice is the but, only thing. But yeah. the marriage brought your beautiful babies. Oh, and we have a photo no um, when, with little Justin Trudeau <laughs> and you and Pierre. Oh. So, uh, what impact did having children have on you at that age, and especially now we know you were living with an undiagnosed mental illness? Well, uh, what happens with bipolar and any of the other big mental illnesses is that they, they rear their head, they, they show up in your early 20s. You have little hiccups in your teens, but it's very hard to distinguish between teenage angst and just trying to find your own identity and your rebellion against your parents, and whether you are going into a mental illness. So I never knew, and I and we never, and back in the 70s, and 70s, never talked about mental illness. I didn't even know what depression meant. I, I mean, knew nothing. So uh, like so many women, I had my first uh, bout of serious depression uh, after the birth of my second child. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a shock to us all because I suddenly, I, I was always, I, I love my babies. I'm just so happy as a mummy. And yet after the birth of Sash, I, I, I lost all interest in life. I didn't want to get out of bed. I couldn't make a choice about what to wear. I couldn't decide on anything, so I'd end up canceling everything, and that's the first start of depression, is isolating. And so it was a very, very clear path that I was on, but n nobody recognized it for what it was. Yeah. And the problem with uh, bipolar, not the problem, the reality of bipolar is as deeply as you fall into a depression, when you come out of the depression, you're going to climb up into mania. And so it's just one to the other, really low and then really high, and with very little normalcy in the middle. So uh, no balance. Yeah. And I didn't know. I, we, I, I, my, I went, Pierre and I went to a psychiatrist right away because this was not me. What was wrong? And uh, he, he just told me it was baby blues. It, it was nothing. But it wasn't. It was serious. And the truth is, and I know this now from the experts, is that if you can nip it in the bud uh, it, it, when it first starts, when you have your first episode of depression, uh, if you can nip, get treatment right away, you can close the neural pathway to depression, and you won't relapse 
again and again through your life when an, every, anything goes wrong, uh, which is what always happened to me when things when things were fine, I was fine, but then when things would start going wrong, I would fall. And so I, I, I didn't know. Uh, getting the balance that I have now, having had the treatment I've had, has, has really changed my life in a profound way. But again, you were on such a platform that you didn't even have time to probably process everything. And, and you talk about wearing a mask during those years oh, yes. of having to go out in public People and present one face. Mask, yeah. and, and now we call it, kind of call that the imposter syndrome, which a lot of women have a word for now when you're, you sort of don't feel like you're good enough or you don't belong or you're being a phony. But we again, you didn't have that word back then. No. So you probably just thought you were. I, I knew I didn't want to be a phony baloney. I have four sisters and they're quite, you know, they, they, they remind you all, you remind each other all the time about how honest you are and whether you're telling the truth. So I always wanted to be truthful, but I didn't know what the truth was about my own condition. And it wasn't, uh, and, I, and I stayed in denial for a long time. Not in, in even though I'd had episodes and I had been hospitalized, uh, I still didn't deeply take it on. Mm -hmm. I, I went to therapy, I took the medication, but inside me I still thought, <laughs> nobody can fix me, there's really nothing wrong with me, it's just the, the way I am, not knowing, oh yes, it, it, it can be fixed, and you do not have to keep battling every day for balance. But being First Lady adds extra pressure to all of that, I'm sure. <laughs> and when that. you look at First Ladies now, what do you think the role should be of someone in that position? Well, I look at my, my daughter-in-law, daughter Law, Sophie, and Justin and Sophie have three beautiful children, and uh, Sophie is one of the healthiest. I mean, she's one of the you know, new age things in her fridge. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> and where is the butter? Well, there is no butter. Vegan butter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> where is the sugar? There's no sugar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, she's so healthy, and she stays at home with the children, and she does a lot of work for her. She works for girls. That's her, her thing. And so she goes out and does her work. But basically, she does no longer has to be... She doesn't have to go to the G7. She doesn't have to travel with Justin. But they are, they really want to be with their children. They want their children to be raised with, with confidence and love and security. And if they're always away, that doesn't happen. So, so she stays home. I think the day when you have to have a spouse at your side as a politician or anything is over. Each one has your, you have your job, you do it. Yeah. And you don't need, to, I used to call it, I said I didn't want to be a rose on Pierre's lapel anymore. He put a, a fresh red rose on his lapel every morning. And I just, I got tired of being the decoration at his side. Yeah. And you know, we do see that now with America's First Lady, Melania Trump, she seems very unhappy in the role. When you look at her <laughs> in that role, how do you feel? What, do you think it's a role that makes her unhappy? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, I think that she, she does a, a very good job when she's on, but I'm sure she values, and she has a child, I'm sure she values, like we all do, the time that she can just be herself and not have to be perfect and, and, and doing everything right and having everybody judge everything that you do. Yeah. Everyone's so judgy, aren't they, Jess? They are so judgy, which brings <laughs> me to our next photo of you uh, standing standing next to the Carters. Oh, the and wonderful this Carters. And beautiful photo oh. you were judged for oh my goodness. because of the length of your dress. Yes, I, I and this was a, a dress that it has pearls all up of it. It, it was made as a, a second wedding dress for me because Pierre and I had a secret wedding. So this is what I wore. It was, just, it was perfect. I'd had three children. I still fit in that day. <laughs> And I thought it was the perfect choice because Pierre and I's our marriage was just about over, and it was kind of symbolic that it was my wedding dress, yeah. and and it was nice. And and then I woke up the next morning, and the headline in the Washington Post was a uh, uh, Canada's prime minister's wife insults President and Mrs. Carter. I thought, how did I do that uh, by having that dress yeah. too short? The level <laughs> of scrutiny is insane, and that was all without social media. I know. Can you imagine what life would have been like for you with Twitter oh and Instagram? Oh, my goodness. I, we didn't have it, thank goodness. It's really, no. really insane. No. And I tell a story of one of my, uh, my big manic episodes where I just ran away and just kept running and running yeah. and running. And uh, I... 
I, I, I had to do it because I, I, I didn't know why I had to do it, but I, I, I just wanted to get away. And yet I, I was away for four days. Pierre, had, I got off to Montreal for the day for shopping. And four days later, Pierre found, found out where I was. I was in Paris because I was trying to get a new passport in the passport <laughs> office. And that's how I found out where I was because we didn't have phones or computers yeah. or texts or anything. There, uh, there was so much freedom and no communication, obviously. <laughs> And I love that story. I won't give too much away, but she was like, yeah, I went to the airport and they like, let me do it. I mean, yeah. You have a France without a passport. Yeah, like, I no big deal. You. Um, you mentioned the mania, though, which for me was something I learned a lot more about in, in your one woman show. And so I want to reiterate to people that it really is an education, I think, for a lot of people That's who aren't familiar. And yeah. um, I think, you know, we can maybe understand depression a little easier with mania and how it presents. Yeah. I thought you do a really beautiful yeah. job in with it, um, it's all about and you've always heard that well you maybe never heard it or listened because if, if you don't have anyone bipolar in your family and you're not why would you know but it's they always say about bipolar it's a chemical imbalance and what it is is we have two wonderful hormones uh, in a serotonin and dopamine and serotonin uh, is replenished every day and it's our feel-good hormone and it's replenished in our brain while we sleep and it makes us feel very good and they discovered many years ago uh, that people People who were in deep depression just couldn't get out of it, no way. They had no more serotonin in their brain. And serotonin is a conductor between the neurotransmitters. So there was no interest, no clicks, nothing meant anything. And that's what depression is. It's not sadness or sorrow. It's just nothing has any meaning. You just don't, there's nothing. And it's, it's empty, empty. The opposite is the mania, sort of the yin-yang. And the yin-yang, we have the best hormone we have in our, our brain is dopamine. And it's the one that charge of our genius, our spirituality, our artistic side. It's the it's huge. And most of us have a steady little flow of dopamine that makes us feel good. And and some artists have more and they're really but a manic person, the dopamine floods that level of the brain above where reason lives. And you're racing so fast you think of one thought, then you think of another and then you think of another and you never get down into reason. So you lose your judgment. You you, you make terrible mistakes, you lack consideration. A person, like I, I really have always thought of myself in my normal state as a really considerate, kind person. And yet in the manic state, I was an entirely different person. I couldn't think, I couldn't go beyond thinking about the immediate and this racing mind. And it was, it's very distressing. And that's where all the trouble comes in. That's where it's like a nuclear bomb goes off in your family because you make huge mistakes. And it, and it really isn't your fault. Uh, it, your fault is that you don't recognize it and seek help and find out why am I acting this way? This isn't me. And do not say, oh, wow, I feel great, let's party. Yeah. No, stop, think, seek help. Uh, because the mania will destroy your life. Yeah, and, and we see celebrities today struggling with mental illness publicly yes. and it is still very stigmatized although I think people are a little more likely to have the conversation now versus in the 70s when you were publicly oh. struggling. Oh yeah, um, it's much better. Well, yeah, how do you see that progress? Do you think we've come far enough or how much further do we have to go to really have these conversations um, I, around? I'll say this, uh, that the older generation or, and particularly the men are the hardest nuts to crack because uh, they really have that old stigma and not wanting to talk about their emotions and, and not sharing sharing and, and suppressing, and so it becomes a, a big problem. Uh, the younger generation is completely different. Uh, they talk about their emotions, they care, well, even Facebook and what you do. There's a lot of sharing of ideas, and you can speak about it. Uh, my own, I have had such a fine mother, a really, really lovely, lovely mother. But when I first got sick, after the birth of my uh, second baby, uh, my sister, eldest sister, who kind of mothered me, as well, uh, she uh, said to mom, uh, mom, Mark's really in trouble. I I've got to go back to her and get her some help. You mean a psychiatrist? No, they only blame the mother. So a lot of people think that if they accept that their children have a mental illness, it's a reflection on how they've parented them or, or the genes they've given. No, don't think that way. Don't take the blame. It's nobody's fault. It's just, it's. do you blame someone if they have diabetes? Do you blame someone if they have heart disease, if they have cancer? No, you get them to hospital, you get them to doctors, and you try and get them into recovery but with mental illness we just turn our head the other way and, and don't talk about it we don't want to 
And then it, I think, continues in a lot of families for generations. And it breaks down the families. And we used to, what we used to do, because there's a lot of substance abuse involved with mental illness when you're not being treated, because you, you don't like the way you're thinking, it's confusing your brain, you don't like your dark thoughts, and you try and, ch and you don't like, or your mania, you're just so excited all the time, you want to slow down. So either alcohol or drugs become, substance abuse is part of mental illness. But we used to just stop right there. And we used to label someone and say, oh, she's an alcoholic, he's an alcoholic, he, oh, he has a drug problem, not saying, no, that's just a symptom. Uh, what he really has is a mental issue, a disorder, uh, that now we know there's a science to it. There didn't used to be a science to it, Brittany. We knew so little about the brain, but now we can see so much more. Yeah. For you, was there a point in your life where you found yourself really heavily medicating and you can look back and really see that as a moment oh, yes. for change? Oh, yeah. Uh, after I lost my, my son, I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't live. I, I, I just didn't want to, I guess. And I, I, it was terrible. But uh, I'll never walk on that path again. Uh, that was the loneliest, worst place I could be, is alone and thinking that life was over, that I had no me it had no meaning and I had no place and I couldn't breathe anymore. Instead of reaching out and saying, help, uh, I just buried myself. Which is um, one of the more emotional parts of your show, I know. but also one of the more inspiring mm -hmm. when you talk yeah. about the work you did to come back from that moment, how your family surrounded you, yeah. and that there is light at the end of this tunnel if you're willing to do it's, the work. And it's a battle. And, and what people have to understand is when you're given the medication, it's not like an Alice and you get a pill and woo, everything changes. No. Uh, the, the, all that the medication, the pharmaceuticals do, is balance the chemicals in your brain and to get, put you on an even level ground. So then you can start the work of changing your mind, of your guilt, of your pain, of your fear, of getting rid of the things that are really holding you back from being a happy person. And that's usually, uh, I, I, I think for with bipolar, um, there's two, two kinds of bipolar people. There's bipolar people who are untreated, and I am so sorry for them because I was one of them. And I know how difficult life is to be always having to put on a mask, to always to try to pretend to people you're not feeling just terrible because you don't want to bring everyone down. So there's a lot of phoniness in it, a lot of isolation. And, and, and then there's treated people who have taken on the treatment, and they're living happy lives. You know, and we have a, I think it is a gift to be bipolar in a certain way because we're lots of fun. <laughs> And we are compassionate, too, because we know what sorrow is. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, for people, where are you at now with your journey with bipolar? What is your relationship with it? And, and how um, do you feel I with accept it now? I'm bipolar. I, at the beginning of my treatment, I... I had to be so, so careful about every choice I made to make, because it's really, it really ends up to be incredibly trite what you have to do once you've got yourself in balance, what you have to do in order to keep yourself in balance. There's three things. You have, number one, you have to get a really good night's sleep because it's during sleep that your brain is cleaned up and you're flushed out all the thoughts that uh, won't serve you. And so, it's the most important thing is sleep. The second the most important thing is exercise. And, and most people say it's because it gives you endorphins, yes. But the real reason that you want to exercise every day, even just a 40 minute walk, yeah. is so that when you put your head on the pillow, you go to sleep <laughs> because you're sleepy, because your muscles are tired. And then the, the third thing, uh, uh, of course, is getting outside, is, 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 is being part, and eating help. No, exercise, getting outside, sleeping, and eating properly, eating for your brain. And that means no processed food. We don't know those chemicals, what they're doing to us. We don't know, they always say to me, they, we don't know whether you're bipolar is environmental, genetic, or I had two concussions falling off my bike when I was a little girl. It could have been head injury. They can't, they don't know. There's no way to determine why you are what you are. It's just accept and we go from here. 
And it, it, it's been quite wonderful journey. But at the beginning, I, I felt like I was on a, a, a high wire, just so careful, so afraid I'd fall, and that I, I'd go back into where I was, and I never wanted to be there again. And, and now I say, I'm not on a super highway, but I'm on a good boardwalk now. <laughs> it's good. It, uh, but it, what it is, is having to pay attention uh, and self-monitoring. And when I get, and I do, I've got a, I've, I think I've sort of got like a water slide in my brain down into depression now. Uh, from the many times I've had depression. And so I have to just put my hand up when the bad, dark thoughts start coming in and I start ruminating and start pulling back. I have to say, mm, I ain't got time for this. Not today. Not now. <laughs> and I a substitute, this is what I learned from cognitive behavioral therapy, is changing your mind. I've not got time for that. And I will do things, I have different things I like to do. I love to cook. I love to go to funny movies. I like to talk to funny friends. I like to go outside. And so I will just make myself change my path so that I will not go there. Now, people who don't know what depression is, they think, well, that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but you don't want to be in depression. It's an illness. It's a terrible illness. Yeah. That's why I think a lot of people will connect with your show, <laughs> is that they can see that the work is needed to be done, but that you can live a more balanced life. If you and can, it's if baby you steps. It. And it honestly, I say my recovery, it, it was five years that it took me to get fully well. And But that's how long it takes the brain to, to uh, heal from a tragic loss, a traumatic loss is five years. And so it was five years after my son died and then followed by Pierre's death that I, I started laughing again. I started living again in a full way. But it was five years of work, of building routine. And it was my family, not uh, my particularly my darling daughter, um, baby steps, little tiny bits of affirmation. Oh, mom, you got your hair done. Or, oh, mom, you went out to lunch. Or mom, noticing the small, which mean nothing to normal people, but for someone who's trying to recover and trying to fit in again and trying to make it, little baby steps and support and, and people noticing your, your family, noticing the little improvements, it's important. It's a journey. It is a journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your journey oh, with you're us. You're so welcome. Um, we do have a couple of questions sure, before we get out of here. pleasure. First one right here. Hi. Hello, Margaret. Uh, you have been a um, uh, mental illness advocate for many years. What do you think is your major achievement in doing so? And if you can tell us a little bit, how was your life here in New York when you were taking uh, acting classes? Well, that, um, if I'm understanding what you're asking, is how have I lived with my mental illness? Well, in your advocacy work, is there something that you're especially proud of? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the, uh, and I think everybody who has a mental illness of any kind of the mental, there's a lot of different disorders. Uh, bipolar is pretty serious, so is schizophrenia. But there's a lot of you know, l mental illness light that we go through little ones. But we still should pay attention to them and, and get a good night's sleep. <laughs> and we'll feel better. Uh, but uh, I think everyone should become an advocate and be proud and not ashamed that they have faced it, battled it, and come through the other side. So uh, for me, I, I just try and, and change people's minds and it's a very rewarding because I get after I give a speech sometimes uh, someone will come up to me who I, she's, she may be a he a different age different life and she'll say you could have been talking about me because when you get it right down, it's a human condition. It's not, it, everybody has it. And we all have emotions that sometimes are out of control. And But people with mental illness are caught in what's called wrong thinking. We're just not thinking right. And we don't know it. We're very resistant. And we will tell you that, oh, no, we're thinking just fine. Right. <laughs> you know, clearly, we're not. Uh, so it, it, it really, for me, it's the chance to, to show people that there is recovery, that you can get a beautiful life back. I, I really was in... Uh, as uh, bipolar has the highest suicide rate of all the mental disorders because we really get tired of letting everyone down. At least that's the way I saw it. And I gave up. I, I was at the end of my life when I had an intervention that saved me from a, a friend and who got my son involved and got me to the hospital. I, I, didn't have a, I didn't have another week to live, according to the doctor, because I had stopped eating and eating food and drinking water because um, I'd gone into psychosis and I, I, I didn't know why I would. I didn't know why I would open up a can. I didn't have any, any nothing connected me. No dots could connect. And so I, I lost over the, uh, after my husband died, after Pierre died, I, I, I lost 40 pounds. And I, I was just 
a, a, a shadow of myself. My, my boy had to go out and buy me boys size 10 jeans because I had no body anymore. Uh, and when the doctor told me that I was had been trying to kill myself, Oh boy, was I angry. <laughs> and I, laugh. I have four children, no way, you're wrong. No, it was my brain, it was my sick brain. It wasn't a conscious decision on my part. And that is the big problem of staying in a mental illness and not getting out of it, is you may lose your life. And it's just a temporary, a very tempor a permanent solution for a temporary problem if you take your life. I mean, you can deal with things. You can, you can, we have the ability. And yet our brain can take us away with compulsion. So by being attentive and by seeking help, you, you can live a good life. So I think that's the biggest thing, is helping people, giving them hope that they can, they don't have to uh, think that it's never going to get better. Yeah. Or feel like they're alone. I'm so alone. Yeah. We make ourselves alone. We pull away. Yeah. yeah. Next one. Hello. Hi there. I was wondering, now that you have a show off Broadway, what is... <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, what is your favorite show that you have seen or you would like to see? The favorite show that On I... On or off Broadway, yeah. Right now? Well, I I'm, and I feel so embarrassed to say this, but I, I have a busy life. I've never seen that Canadian hit come from away. <laughs> and apparently, it's fabulous, and, it, and it's traveled all across Canada as well. But I will. Um, I'd like to see the new To Kill a Mockingbird oh. too. I think it's supposed to be quite wonderful. Yeah, oh, yeah. Awesome. No, I love the theater, and I can't believe that I have the chance <laughs> to do this. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I love too the idea of you being back in New York, even if it's just for a few days. Um, because of your past here with Studio 54 well, and, and Andy Warhol the to that. and all of yes. that. I think we have a photo of you and Andy when back I in the day. When I came here, I, I, I was very sick. I, I was very manic. Uh, and I, I, I had left my husband and I, had, I wanted to make a whole new world. But I'd always wanted to be an actress. And so I, I joined uh, the American, Wynne Hanman's American Place Theater and I, I worked hard. But I, two weeks I was down in New York and two weeks I'm at home up in the attic at 24 for Sussex, uh, Pierre telling me to, he, he always called my, my music, my rock music, jazz. And he'd say to me very politely, Margaret, I have a guest coming tonight. Could you keep your jazz music down? <laughs> So it was very lonely because we were separated, living in the same house. I was mother to the children. I loved my boys. But then I was going down to New York. And, and going to Studio 54 <laughs> was just the most fun thing anybody could imagine. It, it, was, it was crazy, Studio 54. I, a little Canadian girl, I'd never seen anything like it. People were so free. And it wasn't one type of people. Everybody was there, from the, the mayor, the governor, down to uh, and all the drag queens and the brides in there. The, uh, just amazing, a, a, an amazing, spectacular show. But it also, I love to dance, and I was studying acting and going on all around town in subways to, to go to rehearsals and things, and to go down and dance for three hours every night with some great people. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun at Studio 54. Stevie Rubell would call me in the morning and say, Maggie, where all the stars are coming tonight. you got to come down to the studio. I'll send you up a car. Where are you going to be? And I'd tell him an address up in Brooklyn where I was working on a, a scene with whoever I was working with. And the car would come up and <laughs> down I'd go. So great. <laughs> You know, it's just so funny how life works. You know, here you are back in New York, telling your story on a stage. You're performing every night. You know, well for me, it's fulfilling to a be dream. in New York working instead of shopping or, or <laughs> playing. It's like, oh, this is my dream come true. Well, thank you, Audible, yes. for letting me do it. Uh, well, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, everything you just talked about, guys, there's so much more in detail in, in the show. So if you guys do want to check it out, you can catch Certain Women of an Age through September 14th at the Manetta Lane Theater in New York. Or if you're in Toronto, she'll be at the Just for Last Theater from September 19th through 22nd. And if you can't make it to one of the shows, Certain Woman of an Age will be available on audible.com in March. So make sure you check it out and put your hands together for Margaret Trudeau. Thank you. Thank you. I love you to be here.